with I Object Justice Examined, and tonight I have a very interesting show. As most of you know, I'm a Texan, and something has been going on in Texas the last few weeks that has been on the front pages pages of many papers and has been in the forefront of the media, although the coverage, I would say, is pretty bad. Uh, and that has to do with the abduction and removal of the children from the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints ranch out in West Texas, out in El Dorado, West Texas. And as an attorney, I have to tell you that I've been pretty focused on that because I have seen so many questionable things happen that make me wonder about what due process is like in West Texas these days that I, I really wonder about it. And as a guest tonight, or today, I have one of my favorite writers, a Christian libertarian writer who I happened to find about a year ago, who blogs at a wonderful blog called Pro Libertate. His name is William Norman Grigg, and he is the most erudite writer I have ever read, the most interesting writer I have ever read. It's just a pleasure to go to his blog and see a new posting there. But he's also the author of... I believe it's five books at this point in time. Uh, he's presently the editor at large for the Right Source Media Enterprises, which includes a daily news page, the Pro Libertate blog, and the Pro Libertate e journal. Uh, for 12 years, he was senior editor of the national bi weekly magazine, The New America. He's also written many books, including Global Gun Grab, the UN's Campaign to Disarm Americans. And he has a new book called Liberty in Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State. So let me welcome my guest, William Norman Grigg. Will, welcome tonight. Jerry, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being on the show. And you have written extensively the last few days about what has happened in El Dorado, Texas, regarding the women and children of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints church out there, and uh, why, do, why don't you tell everybody, you, you uh, actually were raised as a Mormon, weren't you? That's correct, yes. And as a Mormon, I know, because I've seen your writings before, you take issue with many of the practices of the, the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, is that correct? Yes, the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints are sort of a time capsule of what Mormonism was like in the 1880s. And they are one of many offshoots of Mormonism that hived off at the main branch of the Mormon Church, which is headquartered in Salt Lake City, that's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more colloquially known as the Mormons. There are many of these subgroups that branched off from the main body of Mormonism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries over the question of what they call plural marriage, uh, polygamy, polygyny, that is to say multiple wives married to one man. That had been the practice of the Mormon Church between 1844 and 1890, and it was suppressed as a result of federal action in 1890. And as a condition of being granted to the Union as a state, the Utah government, which was pretty much controlled by the Mormon Church in 1890, agreed to a number of concessions. The most important one was the issuance of a document in early 1890 called the Manifesto, which disavowed the further practice of what they call plural marriage. And they also agreed, among other things, to have a, a state constitution that would have an enhanced separation clause forbidding any church to dominate the functions of the state government. They also agreed to take down their school system. The Mormon church had what we'd call, I guess, a parochial school system. And all these things were dismantled as a result of this great accommodation. Well, there were a number of people in the upper echelons, the Mormon church leadership, and in the laity alike, who didn't like that compromise. And they reorganized themselves over the succeeding decades, between roughly 1890 and about 1930, in a number of offshoots of the Mormon Church. Some of them ended up clustering in northern Mexico in the so-called Mormon colonies. That's where a lot of 
Orthodox Mormons went in sort of a diaspora and took their plural li- wives with them in the 1890s. Some of them fled to Canada, and others sort of branched out and fanned out across the Intermountain West. There are little pockets of Mormon polygamists, uh, so-called fundamentalist Mormon polygamists, throughout Idaho and Utah and Montana. There are some in Oregon. There are a few in the Dakotas. And the fundamentalist Latter-day Saint Church controls a little community that straddles the border between Utah and Arizona. It's called Hilldale, Utah, in Colorado City, Arizona. And they have, since uh, 2004, been building this enclave in El Dorado, Texas, at a place called YFZ Ranch that stands for Yearning for Zion. And the title of that enclave was given to it by Warren Jeffs, who is the now imprisoned leader of the FLDS Church. He's the hereditary patriarch and prophet of that church, and he was something of an amateur musician. He wrote a, a song called Yearning for Zion, and so his followers used that as the name of their community. There are a number of things that distinguish the FLDS church from the mainstream LDS church. The chief question, of course, has to do with succession. <clears throat> the mainstream Mormon church believes that the current leader, uh, Thomas S. Monson, is the only person on earth who has what they call the priesthood keys, which means he's the only one who actually represents God on earth as a spokesman. Warren Jeffs is recognized by the FLDS Church as the incumbent prophet, and hence the person with the exclusive franchise on continuing revelation. And there are other groups, other polygamous groups, who recognize other prophets and patriarchs. And that's a matter of some moment, because in Mormon theology, it's assumed that you cannot attain the highest glory in the hereafter, which is called exaltation. It literally means godhood, an ascent to godhood in Mormon theology, unless you're sealed in a priesthood ceremony in the Mormon temple. And in order to do this, you have to have a prophet who exercises the keys of the sealing power and can delegate them to various representatives. So what the FLDS church is saying is the Warren Jeffs has that power and has conferred it on other leaders of their church. The main church in Salt Lake City says, no, Thomas S. Monson now holds those keys, and he's delegated them to their 12 apostles and so forth. And the other big difference, of course, has to do with the practice of polygamy. Now, the mainstream Mormon church still says in its scriptures, its canonical text, specifically section 132 of a book called The Doctrine and Covenants, which is recognized by the mainstream Mormon church as a book of scripture on a par with the Bible, it still recognizes the principle of plural marriage. The practice has been suspended, but they recognize the principle is a valid and supposedly revealed truth whereas the FLDS church says, no, you have to continue the practice because it was commanded as pretty much a non-negotiable condition for exaltation by God. And so you have these two communities that share the same ancestry and, if you will, the same genotype. They're phenotypically different. They look different. They have slightly different practices, but they speak the same language. They come from the same cultural background. In matters both significant and minute, they really are part of the same movement. And so what really pains me here as a former Mormon, I'm now an evangelical Christian by conviction, apart from the fact that I I believe that both of these religious sects have doctrinal problems that are severe and by no means uh, dismissible, the the real source of anguish for me today is that uh, the main branch of the Mormon Church in Salt Lake City is doing everything it can to disavow and distance itself from the FLDS church rather than speaking up in defense of the rights of the mothers and children who have now been essentially kidnapped by the state of Texas. Both of these denominations, which are very close kindred, they're step-siblings, I'd say, they have a history of intense persecution at the hands of federal authorities in the United States and state authorities in places like New York and Missouri and Illinois and yeah, Utah, they were almost invaded by the U.S. Army, weren't they? Yeah, in the uh, build-up to what was called the Utah War, you actually had that horrific incident on September 11th of 1857 called the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And this happened prior to the arrival of federal troops who were sent there, basically to dethrone Brigham Young as the territorial governor of what was at the time called the Territory of Deseret. And you had horrible things that were done to the Mormons, and you had certain groups of Mormons do horrible things to others. That happened in Missouri. It happened in in Utah. But you have, without a doubt, if you take a look at the suffering that was experienced by the common laity in 
the, the females and children of the Mormon religion back in the 1800s. You've got a unique history of persecution at the hands of government officials. You would think that if there's any group of people in this country who would be extravagantly suspicious of government power would be the Mormons. And if you think that if there's any group of people who would readily speak out and condemn the abuse of power by government, it would be the Mormon leadership. But right now they're doing everything they can to minimize their PR exposure here rather than doing, I think, what is morally required, which is speaking out in defense of these women who are having their children taken away from them at gunpoint. Well, yeah, and, and well, one thing I wanted to make clear to everybody is that you are no apologist for polygamy, and neither am I. Sure. And neither of us are, are, are apologists for uh, marrying underage girls uh, to young or older men, but there's a bigger picture here that impacts every group that does not want to toe the government line, does not want to live in a society that's dominated by materialism, uh, by uh, government schools, that sort of thing. Every one of person who diverts from that should be frightened of what's happened in El Dorado. Do you agree with that? Oh, wholeheartedly. I certainly have no brief for polygamy. That's one of the sources of my terminal disenchantment with the Mormon faith in which I was raised was the idea that someday we would, as members of the Mormon church, as men particularly, be expected to live that principle again. I remember hearing a conversation to that effect just shortly after I was married, and I'm in love with my wife. I don't want to have another wife. I'd never entertain the notion that it would be a good idea. And that particular conversation left a real impact on me. It happened just a month or so after I got married. And the funny thing is I've got no desire to do so. And come to think of it, it seems to me to be wrong from every imaginable direction to expect that someday we would do this. And the way I look at it from the scriptural point of view, which is the most important, of course, is you've got – uh, one bride of Christ, meaning one church, and the one church consists of all those who believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. He doesn't talk about having more than one bride. So the model, I think, would be one man and one woman. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and multiple others. But with, you, with respect to the civil liberties issue here, you've got a situation where <clears throat> on the basis of what has now been pretty much proven to be an entirely bogus phone call, you had an affidavit that – uh, contained third-party hearsay that was used to justify this armed raid. First of all, you had the visit from the, the law enforcement without the raiders uh, to more or less to set the stage for what amounted to a paramilitary attack on this community. This is all done on the basis of an affidavit, the predicate for which was this phone call from a purported 16-year-old uh, pregnant polygamous mother who had been abused by uh, – by her husband, who was fit in either in his late 40s or early 50s, depending upon the account that you read. And the way that the phone call was presented was that this woman had been married and impregnated as a plural so-called wife before the age of 16, which would have been a violation of the law that was passed after the FLDS community transplanted itself into El Dorado. This was passed after they moved there for the specific purpose of criminalizing their marital practices. To me, that smells an awful lot like a bill of attainder. That yeah, specific... explain to everybody what that is, because let, let me tell you, I think there's going to be strong evidence that there was a bill of attainder, because as a matter of fact, the legislator who sponsored that bill has been out strutting about yeah. in West Texas at the hearing, bragging about having sponsored that bill uh, targeting the FLDS. So explain to everybody what you mean by bill of attainder. A bill of attainder, most simply put, would be a law that criminalizes a group of people or an individual rather than criminalizing on an equal basis a specific act that is considered to be a violation of person, property, or good public order. What you'll do is you'll find somebody you want to render a person outside the protection of the law, and you will find something that person does, and you will pass a measure that targets that person and what he does. And what he does, of course, had not previously been considered a criminal act. Some people call that an ex post facto law. It partakes of the same type of injustice as an ex post facto law. The difference is that it specifically targets this individual or this group of individuals. And so it's a violation of the common law principle that law has to be equally binding on everybody. And so in the case of the FLDS, what happened is that the group in the move to Texas, because the age of legal consent was 14, which I think is appalling. <laughs> As well, the father yes. of two young girls, I think it's appalling to think that a 14-year-old would be emotionally or, for that matter, even physically mature enough in order to become a mother. 
And I don't like the idea, obviously, of a, of a girl of, of that age uh, becoming an unwed mother or uh, engaging in sexual relations outside of marriage. As a Christian, I object to that. And I think that there are good practical reasons for objecting to it as well. That being the case, that was the law in Texas when they moved there. And then the law, or what the people in the Texas legislature, and this particular strutting Martinet, is what they're pleased to call the law, was changed in order to criminalize the practices of the FLDS community for the specific purpose of precipitating the kind of action that we're seeing here. But this phone call from this woman who called herself Sarah seemed to be sculpted in such a way as to create exactly the type of a violation of that law that would bring about the action that we saw. And so on the basis of this anonymous phone call, you have an accuser uh, whose, whose identity was never confirmed and for the purposes of the affidavit was listed anonymously. Uh, that affidavit was used to justify first a visit by the local sheriff and a couple of Texas Rangers who were given cooperation. They were let into the community and by Sheriff, I believe his name is Doran, Sheriff Doran's own Correct. report. I'm sorry, he was, uh, they, he said they were accommodating but not cooperative. Now, there might be a distinction there of material significance, but unless you're trained in Jesuitical logic, I don't think you're going to be able to find a really substantive distinction between being accommodating and being cooperative. And on the basis of their supposed lack of cooperation, they brought out the SWAT team. They had a full force raid with uh, material provided by the Department of Homeland Security in the form of the Midland County uh, Sheriff's Department. Uh, they were equipped with body armor and high-performance, high-caliber weapons and an APC. And this is all unnecessary except as a show of force for the purpose of terrorizing these people into allowing the so-called child protection services to go in and seize their children. Well, I have to say, Midland is a far piece from El Dorado, so yeah. I have to wonder whether or not all the pieces in, in place were in, already in place for this SWAT militarized uh, team to come out, regardless of uh, what what the response was of these folks out there. I simply do not believe that this was something gotten together at the last minute. I, mean, I, I think it's fortunate that we didn't have another Waco, but yeah. I, I still am not convinced that that this show of force was necessary, and it's extremely disturbing to see such a thing used against folks that were not known to have an arsenal of weapons mm -hmm. and had never before exhibited any kind of violent conduct or any any kind of uh, had never affirmed the legitim legitimacy of violence. So it's very troubling. But another aspect of this that I think is very troubling is, and I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I called several criminal lawyer friends to ask about that search warrant. And mm -hmm. my understanding from them is that you, do, you that a search warrant based on an anonymous phone call without any other corroborating evidence is not something sanctioned by the United States Supreme Court. So no. I, I wonder about the state of due process in Schleicher County because yeah. a judge would issue such a warrant. You're entirely correct about that, Jerry. And the other thing that I find really disturbing here about that search warrant was the fact that under the Constitution, you have to have a specifically defined objective for a search warrant. You don't have what they had back in the ninth, or forgive me, the 1750s and 60s and 17, early 1770s in the colonial America, writs of assistance which are just basically open-ended, blank check fishing expedition documents that permit you to go in and rummage around through somebody's effects looking for something. You have to have the specific probable cause targeting specific places and items to be searched and, and looked for. And this affidavit was the, most, was the broadest and uh, most open-ended of, of that variety I've ever seen based on an anonymous tip and uh, well, issued – I'm just go ahead – well, exactly, and and uh, not only that, uh, the, the one of the problems is that CPS coming in turns it from a criminal investigation into an administrative civil yeah. proceeding, which enables the government to further uh, be be intrusive and to ignore uh, general constitutional principles. Uh, we're coming up on a hard break right now, so I hope that everybody will stay over and join me. Uh, and my guest, William Norman Grigg, as we talk about what happened in El Dorado, Texas. So stay tuned.
Are you a business owner? Do you accept credit cards? How would you like to be rewarded for every Visa and MasterCard sale your business makes? Sounds too good to be true? Now, instead of credit card transactions costing you money, reward payment systems can reward you for every Visa and MasterCard sale your business makes. With reward points redeemable for plane tickets, hotel rooms, plasma TVs, gift cards at national retailers, and much more. That's right. Every single Visa and MasterCard transaction your business processes each month will earn you valuable points you can redeem for great gifts. Best of all, there's no additional charge for you to start earning reward points. Find out how easy it is for your business to start earning reward points. Call Reward Payment System at 877-676-1467. That's 877-676-1467. That's 877-676-1467. 877-676-1467. When was the last time someone offered you a second chance to save thousands of dollars? Maybe never until now. If you owe the IRS or state at least $10,000, American Tax Relief is offering you a second chance to eliminate up to 83% of your delinquent taxes. Thousands of honest, hardworking Americans just like you have turned to American Tax Relief for the help they need. Look, your tax problem isn't going to go away. As a matter of fact, it's only going to get worse unless you get help. You wouldn't go to court without a lawyer. Now you have qualified help in dealing with the IRS. This is the second chance you've never had before to save up to 83% of the taxes you owe. Get the second chance you deserve and save up to 83% on your delinquent taxes. Call American Tax Relief for a free consultation to see how much money they can save you. 800-951-2341. That's 800-951-2341. Call for your second chance. 800-951-2341. Do it right now. Who's in control, you or your bills? Hi, I'm Bob. Do you need help with your bills? If you've got to choose between paying all your bills and buying groceries, you need help. If you take a cash advance from one card to pay another, you need help. If your paycheck won't cover all your bills, you need help. With DebtHelp.com, you're in charge again. Their money management professionals show you how to get control of your financial life again, and it's pain-free. The folks at DebtHelp.com have the knowledge and contacts you need to get control and stay in control of your debts. Imagine all your bills paid, groceries in the pantry, and enough spare cash to go to the movies. You can do that again with DebtHelp.com. Check them out. DebtHelp.com can help you with other things, too. Credit cards, mortgages, student loans, taxes, it doesn't matter. DebtHelp.com will get them under control. Go to DebtHelp.com and enter my name, Bob, for the priority code. DebtHelp.com. One site, one solution. Jerry Ward back with I Object Justice Examine, and I'm here again with my guest, William Norman Grigg, the author of Liberty and Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State. Uh, Will, uh, thanks for staying over. Sure. And w- when we left uh, for the break, we were talking about the actual raid that occurred, uh, and, and there's plenty to talk about that, but I think it's important that we get into the kind of evidence are, are the reasons that the children were removed, first of all, and the kinds of evidence that the state is using to justify the removal, both uh, in terms of the emergency order of removal and the hearing that was held uh, last Thursday and Friday. Um, and what, what is your understanding of why they felt justified in removing over 400 children from their mothers, of, uh, and, and from what I'm hearing, oh, 300 of which are under five years old. Yeah. There really wasn't any evidence. The, all the evidence is in the realm of speculation here, rooted in the teachings and purported practices of this sect. What happened is that the call from the 16-year-old Sarah was taken as a complaint. It was filtered through a second party, Flora Jessup, and then was inscribed in the search warrant by a female member of the Texas Rangers. They never Why don't you confirmed... tell everybody who Flora Jessup is, because okay, I think I was... that's an important point. Yeah. Flora, Flora Jessup is a disenchanted former member of the FLDS church, and she became disenchanted from that church for very good reason. She came to understand that polygamy 
as practiced by the FLDS leadership, was a form of institutionalized exploitation of very young women. And I don't disagree with that. She also became very disabused of the notion that the people who purported to be representatives of God, Warren Jeffs and his fellow oligarchs of this little sect, were in some sense self-sacrificing men of the cloth when they were living very well at the expense of the people they were ruling. The FLDS church is a community that's entirely insular. They're very endogamous. That's a big problem, too. And Flora Jessup has highlighted this in a documentary that she helped produce called Banking on Heaven. There are a lot of congenital birth defects that have shown up in the FLDS community precisely because they are so so interbred. You get the same type of problem with certain Amish communities as well. Whenever you have people who are entirely withdrawn from the community and they don't interact and they don't proselytize, you limit the gene pool quite severely. And by the way, there are certain pockets of the mainstream Mormon community of which this could be said as well. There are pools of of populations, little pools in uh, southeastern Idaho and in Utah and some parts of Arizona where there have been not quite as drastic forms of intermarriage, but it's been pronounced enough to where you end up with little clusters of genetic defects that are congenital. It's not nearly as dramatic as you find the FLDS community for obvious reasons, but Laura Jessup has operated a halfway house or an underground railroad for people who want to leave the FLDS church, which does operate like a cult in the sense that everybody who belongs to it is under the detailed and perpetual scrutiny of their leaders, and they're expected to obey without question what they are told by the leadership of the FLDS church. And so when somebody makes a break from that community, that person risks everything that he or she has, everything that uh, they've acquired by way of material goods because all the property is owned by the FLDS Church through the United Effort Trust. And if you're a man, you lose your family because Warren Jeffs claims to have the power to reassign wives as he sees fit. Uh, they have, if you will, a form of small C communism of both property and spouses. And once again, these are these are teachings rooted teachings and practices rooted in what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught and did over a century and a half ago. Mm-hmm. So and Flora Jessup essentially is an anti-LDS uh, uh, activist, and, and so was a perfect choice for yeah. this hoaxer to call. She, was been, she, she has been, for the last uh, several years, working very closely with the Sheriff's Department and with uh, authorities not only in Texas but also in Arizona and in Utah. And so when this phone call came in, she was the one who received it. turns out this phone call came from a woman who was 33 years old, living in Colorado Springs, Colorado, who has a history of making bogus phone calls to hotlines claiming to be an abused child. And for whatever reason, she saw fit to portray herself as a 16-year-old named Sarah, who was supposedly married to an individual who had already been convicted in Arizona of illegal sexual cohabitation with an underage girl, uh, he's been convicted of that crime, and he's on probation. He's a registered sex offender until he serves out his sentence. Now, apparently, at that time, he'll be taking off the, taken off the registry. But you had this person, who was anonymous, make this phone call to Flora Jessup, and that was the basis of the affidavit. Now, last Wednesday, the Texas Rangers went to Colorado Springs, and with Colorado Springs officials, they were able to track down this woman by the name of Rosita Swinton, and apparently confirmed that she was the one who had made the phone calls to Flora Jessup. As a matter of fact, this was known contemporaneous with the issuance of that warrant, that the phone call had come from Colorado Springs. And so they were acting, I believe, knowingly. They knowingly acted in a fraudulent fashion to get the affidavit to justify the initial raid. And once they were inside the so-called compound, and by the way, it's always bad news when they start referring to an edifice as a compound, it could be a Quonset hut, it could be a wiki up, it could be a yurt, it could be made out of cardboard or plasterboard, it could be the flimsiest structure imaginable, but when the government decides it's going to attack it and probably kill the people living inside, it becomes an armed compound. Exactly. But this was a complex, you know, this was a community. And once they were inside, the CPS worker said, well, on the basis of what we saw, we decided that there was enough evidence of potential abuse that we had to act with dispatch to take the children out of that environment and separate them from their mothers. Well, what do they see? Well, according to what they said on, on uh, the witness stand, uh, they saw a bunch, of, a bunch of kids who may or may not be 
uh, involved in uh, underage marriages. Some of the kids who were seized are, are apparently you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. Well, that's not necessarily the case because a lot of these women who are identified as being young teenagers have been able to prove that they were 18, 19, 20 years old. The lifestyle that these people live is conducive to longevity. They live active, vigorous outdoor lifestyles. They're very abstemious in their eating and drinking habits. They abstain from alcohol, tobacco, and a number of other deleterious substances. That's something they have in common with mainstream Mormonism as well, which has a very healthy lifestyle. <clears throat> something they also share with the Seventh-day Adventists, of which the Branch Davidians were an offshoot. And so you have a number of instances where these women have been able, been able to prove that they are of legal age, at least, if nothing else, by providing various forms of documentation. Well, on last week in the legal hearing, the objection was raised that, well, in this uh, country where identity theft is a common thing, we, can't, we simply can't confide in the authenticity of these documents either. We have to go with the, the subjective and apparently omniscient perceptions of the child protection workers that these were actually underage women. So well, doing me, everything they possibly can... Bit. I'm sorry. Well, let, let me let me sum this up a little bit, Will, because uh, essentially what you're telling me is that they they once they got this warrant based on a a fake phone call and went yeah. in there, then then they then the CPS workers and the Texas Rangers see girls, pregnant girls that they are, believe are underage, uh, and and therefore they use that to get an emergency order. But we get to court, and we find that that most of those women or girls had legal identifications such as certified birth certificates, Mm -hmm. uh, Social Security numbers, driver's licenses, and yet the judge, instead of accepting that evidence, makes a comment in open court, well, in this day of identity theft, you can't accept these usually acceptable documents uh, to to deter, determine these people's age. Is yeah. that, have I got that right? You've got that exactly right. I mean, we basically entered a reality optional zone. It's very much of a piece with the attitude of the Bush administration here where one of them was quoted plausibly as saying, we make our own reality. I mean, you're dealing here with judicial solipsism. You know, reality is what the judge says it is. And there's also this antic festival of bootstrapping going on where – You have a bad warrant on the basis of what was known to be a bogus phone call that implicated a man uh, who was not present, from what I understand, at the so-called compound at the time when he was supposedly abusing this woman. They couldn't couldn't confirm the people who conducted this raid. They couldn't confirm the identity of of the victim or if the victim actually exists. They couldn't confirm that the purported victimizer had been there. As a matter of fact, there's good evidence he was not there. He was interviewed by the Texas Rangers. They didn't even take him into custody. He was interviewed by the side of the road by the Texas Rangers. Then they shook hands with him and let him go. So you have well, neither a victim I heard, nor a criminal defendant. One account that I read was that he was actually in a different state on probation yeah. and had not entered the state of Texas for at least the last He He was on probation years. in Arizona. Yeah, he was on probation in Arizona and is a registered sex offender. He could not go... He could not go to Texas without checking in with the authorities, and apparently his, his whereabouts were known, and he was nowhere near the so-called compound. So you have neither a victim nor a criminal defendant, so the warrant was uh, based on bogus information. It's summarily invalid, but once they're there, they say, well, we're here anyway, and on the basis of what we saw, we're going to use this as the evidence to establish that these are children at risk and then take them into custody. Now that they're in our custody, we're going to subject them to, gen- to genetic testing, we're going to investigate the content of their beliefs, and we're going to say that the content of their beliefs constitute the danger from which we have to rescue them. And the content of their beliefs, among other things, dictates that it's not only acceptable but necessary uh, in order to obtain the highest exaltation in the hereafter to enter into so-called plural marriages. So on the basis of what the child protection services say could happen at some unspecified future date to some, uh, some unspecified females – that uh, these are children at risk who have to be taken out of that community and separated forcibly from their their mothers. And so here you've got basically uh, preemptive warfare uh, transposed into the key of modern American social policy with the CPS claiming the right basically to wage a preemptive war against a community on the basis of bad intelligence that was known to be bad intelligence at the time they sent in the troops. So really you've got in microcosm the homeland security state and 
the doctrine of unlimited preemptive warfare at work here at the Texas Child Protection Services. Well, and, and that will segue us into your book, but before we get there, one thing that the state will tell you and some, even some family law attorneys is that once the state of Texas has a complaint – uh, of the abuse of a child, just a complaint that they are bound, uh, that they have a duty and are bound under law to investigate, and therefore that they could not have let this, uh, even though the, the telephone call most probably ended up being a hoax, that they could not let that pass, and they had to do an investigation to be adhering to their duty. What do you say to that, Well. If that's the case, they satisfied that requirement when the sheriff looked in on the FLDS uh, community with the consent of the people who lived there and with the consent of their leaders. In order to get the <clears throat> cooperation, although it wasn't described as cooperation, in order to get the cooperation of the FLDS residents there at YFC Ranch, all that was necessary was for the sheriff to call the local bishop. And the bishop instructed the people to cooperate, and they were given full cooperation. That satisfied the necessity of the law. And the fact that they already had plans in motion to send in this paramilitary strike force illustrates that that visit was pretextual. The only thing they wanted was to have a foot in the door so they could get in and get the children out. They so were in acting words, in consummate the, bad faith. So in other words, the sheriff had, had the means and the opportunity to go in and check this complaint out himself. Yeah. And, and rather than so. doing that... In an appropriate fashion, he called in the troops. Well, we've got another hard break, so hopefully everybody will stay tuned and we'll continue the discussion of this very fascinating and troubling case. So uh, stay, stay tuned and we'll be right back. If you're a man or woman concerned about your hair loss, listen up. Follicare, a leading hair growth product, just got even better. Our 94.5% satisfaction rate just wasn't good enough, so we went back to work and created an even better product. I have tried other products and had no success. I can honestly say that Follicare is head and shoulders above the rest. It's great. If you're balding, I'd recommend this to anybody. Follicare works so well because it's a unique, patented, four-in-one product that addresses all the major causes of hair loss, not just one or two. Follicare provides over 50 botanical ingredients and nutrients, plus the only topical solution approved by the FDA to grow hair. I feel like I'm 18 again with, with all this hair on my head. <laughs> I feel good about myself. I'm a much more confident person. Look better and regain your confidence with Follicare, a proven product with more key ingredients than competitors, yet it costs about half as much. Your satisfaction is completely guaranteed. Call 800-309-3642. That's 800-309-3642. Again, 800-309-3642. Did you know you may be qualified for a college scholarship? Listen carefully, because if you're active duty military, in the Guard, the Reserves, a veteran or retired military, you could qualify for a scholarship to Grantham University. Your scholarship includes a significant discount on tuition, all required textbooks and software, and your registration fees. It's your opportunity to earn a college degree from an accredited university. Grantham has been educating the men and women who serve our country for over 50 years. Grantham offers degrees in business administration, engineering, computer science, criminal justice, and many others. And with our online program, you can get your Grantham degree no matter where you're stationed or living. All you need is an internet connection. Call 866-373-3174. That's 866-373-3174. Call right now to find out about your college scholarship. Make the call. 866-373-3174. Need a loan? Get on the Zoom Credit Fast Track. Zoom Credit is America's financial supermarket. Zoom Credit will pre-approve you for refinance, debt consolidation, a new home, or new car loan. While others take days, Zoom Credit loans are processed at the speed of light. Apply at Zoom581.com. That's Zoom581.com. Go online for low interest or no interest credit cards. Zoom Credit even has credit cards that help rebuild your credit. Everyone is approved. No matter what your credit score, go to Zoom and watch it soar. Apply now at Zoom581.com. That's Zoom581.com. Your extra cash, lower interest rates, new home, new car, debt relief, new credit card are just seconds away. Apply online at Zoom581.com today. 
That's Zoom581.com. Zoom Credit. People tested. Credit approved. with William Norman Grigg, the author of Liberty in Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State. And we're going to continue talking about the raid on the ranch out in El Dorado uh, of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Uh, and we're also going to talk about his book and how the things that he writes about in his book com- com- are completely dovetail with what happened out in El Dorado. And well, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit concerned about the state of the evidence that they actually have because uh, after having signed affidavits about all these underage pregnant girls, it appears mm-hmm. that there are only five girls who are 16 and 17, and you don't even know how uh, how many are 17, how many are 16, who happen yes. to be pregnant, um, at least one of which is married to a 17-year-old and that's all the evidence uh, of the, the so-called uh, underage marriages that that we have in this in this case. Is is that the way you read it? Certainly. And if you take a look at the relative risks <clears throat> between the people, uh, the system that the FLDS people were raised in, in terms of child abuse and the sexual exploitation of children, versus the foster care system into which these children are going to be put. The FLDS community, for all of its aberrant teachings and unsavory practices, actually looks relatively good. There was an effort made back in 2004 by uh, Carol Strayhorn of the Comptroller's Office there in the state of Texas to look into And she was also a candidate for the governorship uh, in 2006. Yeah, that, I, I wasn't aware of that, and that might explain... Part of the reason why the administration of Rick Perry shut down her investigation, but she found out looking into the evidence compiled by the Child and Family Protective Services in Texas and the other social institutions there that are involved in the foster care program, the child rate in the foster care system is actually relatively common, and you have a group of victims between 12 and 15 who represent the largest cohort of the victims of that horrible crime, but 13% of the victims of child rape in the foster system were three years old or younger. And according to Strayhorn's findings, and I'm quoting here from a report that she issued in 2006, <clears throat> in April 2004, I said I would give our forgotten children in foster care something they need a voice. I have been and will continue to be their voice. This governor's Health and Human Services Commission continues to stonewall my investigation, and this governor continues to hide the truth. And what she found out was that... Um, you have a huge and metastasizing problem, not only of child sexual exploitation, but you have scores of children who are killed every year through violence and poisoning. You have a huge number of children as young as age three, toddlers, who are being put on these horrible psychotropic drugs and with the active collusion of the foster care system. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the name of the fellow who was the, the witness, the expert witness for the Child Protection Services last week at that farce of a hearing. It was Dr. Perry. Dr. Perry uh, of of Waco infamy. He admitted under oath that the foster care system would be very destructive to the FLDS children. Yet today we saw the first busloads of children being taken from that coliseum to be farmed out in uh, various parts of Texas and also if the CPS has its way um, in Texas, other states. And so they're being taken out of an environment where there was no documentable harm being done to them and being put into a foster care system that is toxic. But apparently yeah, I, because I, the foster care system as the imprimatur of the state is to be considered safer than an isolated aberrant sect. It's just nonsense on stilts. Well, the, the biggest concern I have are for the nursing babies. There are, yes. there are dozens of mothers who are nursing their babies, and, the, and CPS intends to, ri- as it stands right now, intends to rip those babies away from their nursing mothers, despite the fact that the only evidence of imminent, uh, there's no evidence of any abuse. The only evidence, or so-called evidence, of imminent abuse is that these, according to the CPS investigator who testified, is that these babies might be raised to believe that marrying extremely young and having numerous children is the blessing of, of the Lord. And that was the actual mm-hmm. testimony yeah. with regard to these babies. <clears throat> so what and, you're doing, and, what, 
they're criminalizing a a set of religious beliefs that are not facially criminal. I mean, if your religious beliefs involve child sacrifice, uh, human sacrifice along the line of my Aztec ancestors, for instance, obviously you're dealing with something that is on the face of a criminal. But simply to be raised to believe that a woman's destiny is to become the mother of a large brood of children and to marry as young as biologically possible and, and as young as legally possible, apparently, from the, what we know of the, the available evidence here, the, the women being pregnant at 16 and 17, which is not illegal in Texas, if that's the content of religious beliefs, it's innocuous, however strange it might seem to us. And yet it's the, on that basis of teaching something that is, that is not illegal – that the CPS is trying to say that uh, these children, these, these girl children, the men children be indoctrinated in the same ideology, that they'd be abused by virtue of the content of the religious teachings. And that's one of the reasons that the mothers are not being allowed to pray with their children without the supervision of child protection workers. That is something that strikes me as a genuinely Soviet touch, that they have to have officially designated government-approved prayer monitors as these people are simply communing to worship as is their custom – the other thing I find completely repellent was Judge Walther's blithe statement yesterday with respect to nursing mothers that, well, every day in this country, women go to work after six weeks of maternity leave, so it's no big deal to leave your nursing child behind. Well, if you choose to, that's no big deal, but you're having this basically inflicted on these people, on these FLDS mothers and the children who are dependent on them by judicial fiat rather than choosing to do so as a result of their own beliefs and customs. That is something that strikes me as just transcendently arrogant and cruel that this judge would say on the basis of the fact that in a society that these people have refused to live in as a matter of moral conviction, it's, it's entirely common to see women turn their children over to be raised by, by rented strangers because this is done in the society they've rejected. These people have to accept that mode of living. When, of course, the judge recognized that breastfeeding is the healthiest way to raise a child, that these children were dependent upon their mothers, and the mothers had a huge emotional, invest emotional investment in this child. I mean, this is this is not only uh, ideologically lunatic, but it, it borders on being sociopathic, I, just a clinical indifference to the gratuitous suffering of people who've not been accused of any criminal acts yet. These people are being held. They've been held for weeks, separated, held under armed guard. They've not been accused of any crime. To the extent that there is anything that happened of a criminal nature in that community, these are the victims, and they're being treated this way. Yeah, the women. Yeah, the women if, and if they the were children indeed married, married at a young age, they, at an age that's younger than the law allows, they are the victims, and yet they are being treated as criminals. Well, well, we need to get to your book because I think sure. your book uh, – uh, First of all, why don't you tell everyone where they can buy your book? The easiest way to find it is to go to the homepage of The Right Source, which is, once again, the entity I work for, www.rightsourceonline.com. Once again, that's one word, rightsourceonline.com. There's a banner ad at the top of the page for my book, Liberty and Eclipse. And, and why don't you tell us, in a, actually, I'm going to have you come back on during the last three minutes of, of the segment, because I want you to talk about... Uh, as quickly as you can during that last segment, your book and how it relates to this case. All right. And we'll just end the show like th that. Uh, but we're coming up on another hard break, and I want you to have at least two, two, to, uh, two and a half minutes to discuss your book. So everyone stay tuned, and we'll talk about Will's book as quickly as we can when we return. <laughs> Get a free Razor cell phone delivered free to your door. Don't want a free Razor? Then go to letstalk14.com and choose from hundreds of other free phones. Join 500,000 users who found the smartest way to buy their cell phones. Never pay retail again. At letstalk14.com, you can compare prices on phones and service plans from all the major carriers. Find the coolest new phone at the coolest price. Find the best current special offers. Read what folks have to say about their phones and plans. They actually rate and review their phones and service plans so you know which ones to pick. Do it all in the comfort of your own home. If your plan is ending, now's your chance. Try your new phone risk-free for seven days with free 48-hour shipping. Let's talk 14.com is the only way to get the absolute best deal possible. Right now, get a free razor after $50 mail-in rebate. This is an exclusive online offer at letstalk14.com. 
New two-year service plan agreement required. One-time wireless activation and early termination fees may apply. Go to Let's Talk 14.com. That's Let's Talk 14.com. What America needs is affordable health insurance. Finding affordable health insurance for you and your family, it's on everyone's mind right now. If you're self-employed, it's on your mind, too. One of the things we face as entrepreneurial Americans is finding affordable health insurance. Well, I found a company you can call right now and get affordable health insurance. Midwest National Life Insurance Company of Tennessee. Write this number down, 877-592-7780. That's 877-592-7780. Midwest specializes in helping entrepreneurs of all kinds, those of us who run small businesses or don't get health insurance where we work, to protect our families with affordable health insurance. Call 877-592-7780. Not available in all states. Association membership is required in most states. Home office, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Exclusions and limitations apply. Attention, annuity and structured settlement holders. Waiting years for your annuity payments? Now you can break free from a schedule set years ago. You don't have to wait years. Get the money you need now. Call 800-463-4052. Novation Capital has prepared a free DVD to explain how you can get your money when you need it. Call Novation Capital today at 800-463-4052 for your free informational DVD. Take control of your structured settlement or annuity. Lives change. A schedule set years ago may not make sense for you today. Call 800-463-4052. Find out how you can get your money when you need it. Call 800-463-4052 for your free DVD. That's 800-463-4052. Novation Capital. Your money when you need it. the last segment with my guest, William Norman Grigg, the author of Liberty and Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State. And, Will, why don't you describe for us how the theme of your book fits into what happened in El Dorado, and generally, what what can we do about abuses by the government like this? What's happened is that for the last 40 years, using various pretexts, the federal government has militarized and centralized our law enforcement apparatus. We no longer have local police, state police, locally independent sheriffs. They're all appendages of this nationalized law enforcement op- apparatus I call the Homeland Security State. And with respect to the FLDS, you have this raid by the Midland County Sheriff's Department using equipment provided to them by the Pentagon through the law enforcement support organization and from the Department of Homeland Security in order to attack this group of people who are now considered, for all intents and purposes, people outside the protection of the law. With respect to the terror suspects, we call those people unlawful enemy combatants. The due process guarantees don't extend to them. They don't have the right of uh, habeas corpus. The same situation prevails with respect to the women and children of the FLDS Church. They're now outside the protection of the law, having been taken into the custody of the government by this federalized law enforcement apparatus working in a multi-jurisdictional fashion. This is a perfect illustration of the way the Homeland Security State operates, which is one reason I'm so obsessed about it. Well, and also it's not only the militarization of the police, there's federal grants uh, involved if if CPS adopts out these children. Yeah, they get huge premiums for adopting out the children. Uh, Especially nice Anglo babies that are in demand in uh, the the adoption system. That's repulsive. Well, Will, I want to thank you for being with me today. This this is very interesting. I'm going to recommend that everybody buy your book, Liberty and Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State, that they go read your writings at Pro Libertate. And why don't you give the URL... Thanks so much. Uh, well, what's your URL for your blog? Uh, freedom, freedominourtime.blogspot.com. So everyone go there and read his great writings. And I'll be back in, in two weeks, and I'm going to have two eminent economists to face the minimum wage issue. So stay tuned in two weeks.
This is Right Talk Radio. 